Good evening, New Beginning Church and our online family and friends. We thank God for you on tonight joining us. On tonight, we just want to thank and praise God for just being God. God is all we need. And if we have God in our lives, guess what? Our lives are secure. So if you have breath in your body, then it's not too late for you to give God the glory and to thank God for all that he has done in your life. So we praise and thank God on tonight. Our scripture is Psalm 96, 1 through 4. Psalm 96, 1 through 4. And it reads, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord, praise his name. Each day, proclaim the good news that he saves. Publish his glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things he does. Great is the Lord, for he is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared by all gods, above all gods. I sing praises to your name. We give glory to your name. We give worship to your name. Why? For your name is great and greatly to be praised. Help us sing. I sing praises. in the name of Jesus Christ we come. We thank you for another privilege, another honor, another opportunity to come before you. We thank you, Father God, for blessing us again to come into your presence. Lord, we magnify you, we glorify you, we lift you, Father God, for you are God and you are God alone. We thank you, Father God, for this privilege of studying your word 
that your word, Father God, will fall on good soil, that your word, Father God, will make us better, that your word, Father God, will be passed from one person and one generation to the other. Lord, we thank you, Father God, for meeting us now. We ask you, Father God, to continue to watch over us. Keep us in our right mind. Give us a hunger, a desire for your word, Father God, that your word will continue to lead us and guide us. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. I give praises to your name. Oh, Lord, praise it to your name. Oh, Lord, for your name is great and greatly to be praised. Hallelujah. We serve the awesome and the amazing God. His name is great. And he is greatly to be praised. Amen. Hallelujah. He is greatly to be praised. Amen. Tonight we are at Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. This serves as our second session in Colossians. On well, last week we gave an introduction of Colossians. So tonight we'll begin with verse number 3. And hopefully time permits us to cover the whole pericope, which is verses 3 through 8. Verses 3. 3 through 8 is where we're going to look to go to tonight. Uh, if we run out of time, then you can tell me what it was about in your reading and your studying. Amen. Thank God for so many who have joined in with us through Facebook Live as well as Zoom. Thank you for joining us here at the New Beginning Church from our remote location. Thank you for being a part of our service. Let's look now at Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 through 8 is where we are tonight. Colossians chapter 1, verses 3 to 8, through 8. We understand that the Apostle Paul is writing, <clears throat> and as he is writing, he is either writing from a prison cell, or he is writing from house arrest. Theologians are split on where he is writing this letter. So we know that Paul is not at a resort. <laughs> Paul is not at a house. Paul is not moving about on his own, but he stops in the midst of all of his depression, his oppression, and his distress long enough to instruct us even in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. The Apostle Paul is the author here. He has along with him Timothy. We find that out in verse number one. Then in verse number two, we realize who he is writing to. He is writing to the church at Colossae. He is writing to the church at Colossae. Uh, he's writing to the faithful brethren of the church at Colossae. So he's writing to those who are deemed to be Christians, those who have been redeemed, and now they are Christians. Some may call it Christians. They are Christians of the faith. He starts off by saying in verse number one and two, he talks about the fact that they've been faithful to the cause, the cause of Jesus Christ. And he says, grace to you and peace from God. This, this peace is from the almighty God, the self-existing God, the God that is almighty and all-powerful. He says, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And we covered last week and, and we covered those two verses. It took us a while to do the introduction and cover those verses. So tonight we'll begin with uh, verse number three and go to verse number eight. Let's look at verse number three, and we're going to look to get through verse number eight. If we don't, we'll pick up where we leave off. Amen. We give thanks to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, praying for you since you have heard, since, since we have heard of your faith. Paul is saying to this church at Colossae, to the Colossian church, Paul, the apostle Paul, is saying that we are always praying for you. We are praying for you always, he says. We are in prayer for you. Let me tell you, preachers and pastors all over the world ought to be praying for the congregation. We ought to be in prayer. We ought to be taking the church before the Lord in prayer. Any pastor who is leading, any instructor who is teaching, any minister that says he is called, 
he ought to be praying for the believers. Today, for sure, we ought to be praying for the believers. We ought to be praying for believers everywhere. We ought to be in prayer. So, so the Apostle Paul says, first of all, we give thanks. This word thank, thanks is an expression of generosity. It is a, an expression of gratitude. It is a, an expression of being grateful. They are grateful to God. They give grace unto the Lord. It is. It comes from the same word that we get the word that we for, that we formulate when we are giving grace, grace over our food. It is. It, it is synonymous to giving the giving of grace right before we eat our food. He says, "I am giving thanks to you continuously. Thanks to God for you, rather continuously." I am thanking the Lord Jesus Christ. I am thanking God, Theos God, Theos God, the God, the Father. I'm thanking him, the supreme God, the supreme deity, the supreme divinity, the exceeding one. I'm thanking him for you. I'm giving an expression of gratitude. What, what Paul is saying here, he's thanking God for this church. And we're going to find out the reason why he's thanking God for this church. He, he, he thanks God for this church for three things. I want you to pick them up as we go. First of all, he says, I'm praying always. We are praying always to you, for you. Uh, and we are praying and we are thanking God, the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So he makes a distinction here. Don't skip over words because you know these words. He says, I am thanking the God, the Father of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. He is thanking the Supreme One. And he identifies him as the parent. This word father is simply the parent, the one who is the parent of our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ. This word Lord means the supreme one, the supreme one in authority. Lord means controller. Lord means master. This is a title of respect. So he's saying that I thank God, the almighty God, the father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I am thanking him. I'm thanking the Lord. I'm thanking God, the one that is the father of our Lord. The word Lord is the supreme authority, the controller, the master, the one who we give all respect to, God the Father, Son, Jesus the Christ. I told you last week that the God we serve is a triune God. He is God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So he says that I'm thankful to you. I give gratitude for you. I am praying always. This word, this, this, this phrase, Jesus Christ, is the Son of God, the anointed one. The word Messiah means the anointed one. The word Messiah, the word Christ means Messiah. The word Christ means the anointed one. Therefore, the word Christ and Messiah means the anointed Christ himself, the anointed one, the Messiah, praying always for you. Saying that I'm always praying. This word praying means supplication. This word praying always means worship. You see, for some people, praying is saying, Lord, help me. Right now, I'm in trouble. But Paul is saying that he's praying always for them, and he's praying always for them as he worship God. Let me tell you, you ought not just be praying to be praying. You ought to be praying to worship God. Jesus says, when you pray, you pray like this. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's a moment of worship. When we pray, we ought to have a moment of worship. We ought to have a moment where we supplicate. Supplicate means that we are in travail to get in touch with God. 
We don't just get down there and say, Lord, have mercy. Or we don't just walk in our daily routine and say, Lord, have mercy and keep it going. And what we need to do is we need to travail like a woman that's having a baby. We ought to sometimes be in pain when we're crying out to God. You ought to be in pain sometimes. You ought to be in agony sometimes. And not only that, you ought to be in worship. When you in prayer, you ought to be in worship. Lord, hallowed to be your name. Lord, we glorify you. Lord, we praise you. Lord, we magnify you. When you pray, you ought to be in worship. That's why when we're in church, people ought not be walking when the word is being read. People ought not be walking when we're in prayer. People ought not be walking when the invitation is given because we are still in worship. And not only that, people ought not be walking when we're giving our tithes, offerings, and sacrificial gifts except to bring your money to the Lord mm -hmm. because giving is worship. Yes. And we ought to be in worship when we come before the Lord. That's why we can't come before the Lord any or attitude in any old hept his way. We need to come before the Lord humbly before him. We must come before the Lord in reverence. We must come before the Lord in awe of him. I told you before, if the former president Barack Obama was to walk in the room, men would stand up in great honor for him. When he went to a basketball game, men stood up and women and children stood up in the whole arena, clapped for him and celebrated him for long periods of time because they gave honor to a great man. Yes. But when Jesus shows up, you don't stand up and worship him. You bow down and worship him. You see, you honor other men but you give glory and magnify the Lord himself. Yeah. You can't stand in his presence because when Jesus shows up, we must bow down. When God is on the scene, when we're talking to the Lord, we may not be physically bowed, but in our hearts, in our spirit, in our attitude, we are humble before the magnificent God. There is none like him. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter what God you call on Buddha. He's not like him. Confucius, he's not like him. Yes. Aristotle, not like him. There is no God like our God, Jehovah God. Mm -hmm. There is none like him. Mm -hmm. That's why I'm able to tell the Jehovah's Witnesses, I don't mind you being a Jehovah's Witness. I am a Jehovah's Witness also. Because I honor Jehovah God. I honor Yahweh God. I honor God himself. There is none like him. I glorify him. I magnify him. We ought not glorify any other man. We ought to glorify our God. Yes. So when we pray, we pray, we ought to be in worship. Paul says, I'm taking you in behind the veil. I'm taking you into the Holy of Holies with me. He's saying to this church, I give thanks for you, for you to the Lord God, Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. I give thanks for you. I am praying always for you. Since you heard of, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus, Paul says, we have heard. This word, since we've heard, this, this word heard means that it has been noised. It has been sounded. It has been reported and it has been understood that you have great faith. He says, since, since we heard, since, we, since it has come to our hearing, since we have become the audience, since we've gained the report of you, ever since then, we've been praying for you. Whenever you hear of one coming to Christ, you need to be praying for that person. Because if the devil, if the devil was not on their trail, the devil is on their trail now. 
We ought to be in prayer when one more saint come to the Lord. We ought to celebrate. We ought to be in worship when somebody gives their lives to Christ. The problem is we give honor to God when we raise a lot of money, and we ought to. But the problem is we won't give honor to God when one soul comes to Christ. Paul says here that since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, since we've heard of your faith, this word faith means reliance. Word faith means your salvation. Word faith means your, your growth and your continuance. He says that we have heard of how steadfast and constant you were in the faith. You, you have an assurance in Jesus Christ. You have the assurance of Jesus Christ. You have come to faith in Jesus Christ, and we're proud of it. We're glad about it. We're celebrating God because of it. Not so much we're celebrating God because one new person has come. We're so glad that all of you have come. Sometimes people will celebrate God when their family members come, but they won't celebrate when anybody else comes. Mm -hmm. says, since we heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, and we've heard of your love, and we've heard of your love for all the saints, it's saying to us today, we celebrate, we worship, we pray for you. Since we've heard of your faith in Jesus Christ, since we've heard of your love for all the saints. What he's saying here is, we have, we, we've heard of your affection, your love, your charity. He says, we've heard of you and your love until your love has become a love feast. Your love has come before our ears. We have heard of your love for all the saints. We've heard of your love for each other. Let me tell you, if you go to church with somebody, you ought to love that person. Mm -hmm. And your love ought to show. If you, if you go to church with somebody, you ought to have love for that person. And not only that, not only should you have love for the person that's at your church, you ought to have love for all the saints. That's what Paul says right there in Colossians chapter 1 and, and, and verse number 3 and 4. He says, we've heard of your faith, we've heard of your love, and your love is all exclusive. He says, your faith has developed, meaning that your faith has grown to the point where your faith is continuing to grow. It's continuing to grow. And your faith has grown to the point where you love other folk. Regardless of if they're your enemies or not, you've learned, you've learned to love people. And there are some people in church that are not very lovable. There are some people in church that it's not easy to love. But Paul says, your love has become inclusive. So inclusive until you not only love the church members at your church, not only the Christians in your neighborhood, you also love all the saints. Mm -hmm. Your love has become a love fest. You, you not only love the Colossians, but you also love others because you love all the saints. Verse 5, he says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven, of which you heard before the word of the truth of the gospel. Now, this is a tongue. These next two, three verses is a tongue tire for me. <laughs> these next two, three verses in English, we would call it run on sentences. Where he just keep going. He put a comma there and keep running. And then sometimes he doesn't put a comma there. But look what, it, what, what he says. Remember, the Bible was not written in verses and with commas and periods as we know it today. It wasn't written in paragraph. It was not broken down into pericopes and one main thought like we know it today. The Bible was written on a stroll. Mm -hmm. And as it was written on that stroll, it was just one continual group, groups of writings. So when we look at the text, it shows forth some of that writing. And if I was, was to write this this way in my English class, 
I would get red ink all over my paper. But look what he said. Verse number five, he says, because of the hope which is laid up for you in heaven. First of all, he says, we've heard of your faith. We heard of your love. And we've also heard of your hope. Those are the three things he's thanking the Lord for. He says, we, Timothy and I, Paul says, Timothy and I have heard of your faith, how you depend on God. You, you have a reliance on God. We've heard of your assurance through your faith. We've heard of your love. And now we've also heard of the hope that you have. It is because hope is expectation. Hope is confidence. Hope is believing beyond your faith. The late Pastor Manson Johnson would put it like this. I don't know if he, he got it from somebody else or not, but he would say that hope is faith standing on his tiptoes, looking over the horizon to see what is coming next. Hope is expectation. Hope is confidence. Hope is standing on one's tiptoes, looking over the horizon to see what blessings God going to bring next. You ought to have some hope in your life. You see, man can live without food for 40 days. Man can live without water for 40 hours. Man can live without air for seven minutes. But man cannot live two seconds without hope. We need hope. We need expectation. We need to be able to see the future. We, able, we need to be able to look over into the future. And God, through his word, gives us a continual glimpse of the future. Mm -hmm. Through his word, we, we know that we win. We know that when this earthly tabernacle has been dissolved down here, according to 2 Corinthians chapter 5, we know when this tent is dissolved down here, we have a hope. We have a new, we have a new home. We have a new building. Mm -hmm. And I'm hoping for it. And it's a building that's not made by hand. Mm -hmm. Paul says, because of your hope, which is laid up for you in heaven. Look, look at what Paul said. He says, first of all, your faith gives you love mm -hmm. and your love gives you hope. Mm -hmm. And because of your hope, there's something laid up for you in heaven. <laughs> this word, this phrase, these, these two, this compound word laid up means there's something on reserve for you. That, that means that, that there's something appointed just for you. It, it means this word, this word, this phrase laid up, this compound word laid up means that it is awaiting you. Yeah, right there, right there in the text, Paul says, your love says your faith and your hope has come together. And because you have hope in Jesus Christ, because you have hope in God the Father, there is some on reserve for you. It is laid up for you, which is in heaven. It is laid up. It's on reserve. It is appointed unto you. Now we use the phrase le 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 we, we use the phrase loosely here on planet Earth when we say, "Well, what's for you is for you." Let me just share something with you. What's on the other side for you is for you. Yes. God has laid it up for you because you got hope, because you have love, because you have faith, because you have hope, there is something on reserve for you, something laid up for you. He says, where it is, is in heaven. Word heaven is an elevated place. The word heaven is, is the sky. The word heaven is, is an exalted place. The word heaven is eternal air. It's a place of gladness, a place of happiness, and a place of power. The Bible declares that it's laid up for you over in this elevated place. You have a promise laid up for you over in the sky. You have a promise that is, it's in the, in the eternal air where God is in heaven. It's a place of power, a place of peace. It's a place of happiness. It says that 
It's laid up in heaven. And then it goes on to say, of which you heard before the word of truth of the gospel. Now you've heard this before. He says that you've heard this before. You've heard this before. This is not new to you. You have, you have anticipated this. You have a record of this. You've heard this before. He says that, that you already have heard it. You've already known it. You've heard it before. It's the word of truth. This phrase, word of truth, divine expression, you, a communication, a divine communication. In other words, you, you heard it from the word of truth. You heard it from the utterance of the Holy Scripture. You've heard it before. That's why it's dangerous. It's very dangerous for you to hear the word and not obey the word. Mm -hmm. Second Peter chapter 2, verses 19 through 22 says it like this. It says, it would have been better had you not known the way of righteousness than to know the way of righteousness and turn back to your evil ways again. It goes on to say that you're nothing more than a dog or a hog. Going back, the, the hog, the sow, it says in King James, the sow gets cleaned up and runs right back to the mud and gets right back dirty again. And then it says the dog, he vomits up what he has eaten and he laps it back up again. That's what it is when we get out of our sin, when God delivers us from our sin, when we hear the holy word of God and we know we're wrong and we don't confess that we're wrong and won't, won't talk to the Lord about our wrong. The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 2, it says that we run back like a dog and a hog, get all dirty like we were and dump our vomit and lick it up again. Dump our vomit and lick it up again. Regurgitate it and lick it up again. Peter says, it would have been better had you not known the way of righteousness than to know that way and go back to your old ways. Paul is saying to us now, this is not new to you. You've heard the word of truth. You've heard this word of truth. You've, you've heard it and, and you know it. It's in your spirit. You know this. The gospel, the word gospel is the good message of Jesus Christ. This word gospel is the good message of God. So let me let me uh, unpack this verse five here before we go much further and say to you, our faith is grounded in the past. Our faith is grounded in the past because it is the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Let me say that again. Our faith is grounded in the past because it is dependent on the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. You see, our faith is not what we have done. Our faith is what Christ has done for us mm -hmm. over 2,000 years ago on Calvary. So our faith is grounded in the past. It is because of the finished work of Jesus Christ on Calvary. Our love flows from our faith. Our love flows from our faith. We, we can't have love unless we got faith. Because if you, have, if you try to have love and do not have faith, you're going to find yourself frustrated. Because as you walk in faith with Jesus Christ, as you walk in faith with the Lord, then you're able to put your love out there. You know, some people can't love like they used to love. But when you have faith in Jesus Christ, you're able to let him walk you to the point of love. You allow him to, to be your controller, your Lord, be your master, your Lord. And you can trust Jesus more than you can trust Tyrone. You can trust Jesus more than you can, you can trust Shemekah now. When you trust Jesus, then you can lay out on faith and you can have control of your love. So when we have faith, we operate in the present. 
When we have love, we operate on what Jesus has already done through our faith. And finally, hope is the results of our faith. Hope, meaning that we're going to rely on the future. So we have love, hope, and faith. Faith, hope, and love. 1 Corinthians chapter 13 says, the greater, the greatest is the love. Hope is the results of faith. Our hope is to be rewarded with the treasures that are laid up for us, mm -hmm. that are stored up for us, that are awaiting us over in heaven. I told you that heaven was an elevated place. So, so this faith that we have, it ushers in love. Love ushers in hope. And because we have faith, love, and hope, there is something laid up. There are treasures laid up for us in heaven. You think your car, you think your house is a big shot car house? The Bible says that Jesus is going to go to prepare a place for us. He has gone. That where he is, we may be also. Mm -hmm. And when we get over there, he has a mansion, just our style. Now, when he was talking to the Jews, the Jews understood this talk. But we in America don't really understand that kind of talk. Because when they had a mansion, all the children would gather in that one Jewish mansion. Mm -hmm. And they would be with their father 24 hours a day. This is the picture that Jesus is painting. If you can't get along with folk, now you better try to get along with them because we all going to be in this mansion. Mm -hmm. And we're going to be all in there and there will be plenty of good room. Mm -hmm. There won't be any backbiting and jealousy over in heaven up in heaven, in the sky, in the elevated place. In the eternal air, there will be no jealousy. Get your heart right now. There will be no jealousy. And he says, over in, over there, that he's the place where he's preparing for us, what we need to understand is there's a mansion over there. Mm -hmm. And all of us going to be in our mansions, and the Father will be present with us 24 hours a day as we know time. But we don't know eternity the way God knows eternity. Eternity is from now on. We will for, forever be with each other. Amen. He says, he says to us that the word of truth is present. Says to us that we're going over there in heaven. You've already heard it, this before now. I'm not telling you anything new. And there are some people that's listening to me tonight. I'm not telling you anything new. Mm -hmm. But it's encouraging to us. Yes. It reminds us in the middle of a pandemic that we can love each other, black, white, red, yellow, brown. Yes. It encourages us that we have to walk by faith in Jesus Christ, that he can keep us on earth and take us to heaven. And it encourages us that we have a lively hope Paul says in, in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 6, verses 13 through, through, through 18, Paul says to us that I have you not ignorant, my brethren, meaning I have you not to be misinformed. Mm -hmm. I have you not to be not knowing, unknowing. I have you not to be ignorant, my brother. Don't concern yourself with your loved ones who have fallen asleep in Christ. For those who have fallen asleep, King James says, they will not be prevented by those of us who are alive. This word prevented in the original Greek means we will not go before them. We will not perceive them. It says we will not perceive them that have fallen asleep in Christ Jesus. What it's saying to us is the dead in Christ shall rise first. Mm -hmm. And those of us who remain will be caught up with him in midair. I have this hope today yes. that I'm going to be caught up with Jesus in mid -air. He says it will happen at the trump of God, at the voice of the archangel. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 13 through 18 says, we will be caught up with him in midair. I have this hope. Paul says right here in, in Colossians chapter 1, verses number 3 through 5, he says we ought to have a hope. Mm -hmm. He's thanking this church for having a lively hope. Every church of Jesus Christ ought to have hope in Jesus Christ mm -hmm. and ought to have hope in the treasures that are laid up for us up yonder. That's why when a saint died in the Lord and we're having the funeral, usually the song that we march out on is I'm going up yonder. I'm going up yonder to see the king. I'm going up yonder. Where are you going? I'm going up yonder. I'm going up yonder. I'm going on the other side. And, and over yonder, there's no backbiting. There's no gossiping. There's no shouting. There's no shouting at each other. There's no tripping going on. And there is no drama. Who was it, Mary J. Bride, Sister Davis, that said no more drama? Come on, don't be acting like you, you're so holy now. There will be no more drama over there. Oh, Jesus. There's no more drama. <laughs> Verse number six, it says, which has come to you. And as, and as it has always also in the world is bringing forth fruit. Our faith brings forth fruit. fruit. Our love brings forth fruit. We're talking about over yonder now. We're talking about in the sky, in the eternal air. It says that what we do down here is bringing forth fruit over there. And not only what we do down here is bringing forth fruit over there, it's bringing forth fruit right here. God. Is, is celebrating us. God is, is blessing us with growth and fruit even while we're down here. It's bringing forth fruit as it is also among you since the day you, day you heard and knew the grace of God in truth. It says, it, from the day you got saved, from the day you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your Lord, you've been sending up some timber. You've been sending up things that, that, that is laid up for you. The Bible says it's stored up for you. It's laid up for you. It is there for you. It is awaiting you. But you got to go up there to get it. Some things we will receive down here, but the great treasures that God has for us they are laid up on the other side. It's bringing forth. He says, we are praying for you because we've heard of your love. We've, we've heard of your faith. We've heard of your hope. We're praying for you. The problem today is people don't pray for their pastors. They don't pray for their Sunday school teachers. They don't pray for their church leaders. They don't pray for their Bible study teachers because they think we got it all going on. But when we are walking with the Lord, we need prayer the more. Amen. We need you to lift us. We need you to, to call our name before the Lord. We, we need the Lord to unction us, to move on us, that we will make wise decisions. When have, the, when have you last prayed for your local musician? When have you last prayed for your, your usher? When have you last prayed for your greeter? When have you last prayed for your choir member? When have you last prayed for your pastor? When have you last prayed for the youth, for the senior citizens? When have you last prayed that God will bless your church? Have you been praying for COVID-19 to escape from us, to leave us, to stop tripping with us? We ought to be praying, Lord, take it out of here. Lord, with a vaccine or without a vaccine, I know you can do it, Father God, in the twinkling of an eye. Yes, you can. God, you can do it. We ought to be praying. The church ought to be in prayer now. The church ought to be calling on the Lord. Whether you call on the Lord in a corporate setting where we get together or whether we call on the Lord by telephone together or whether we call on the Lord by electronic gadgets together. Every individual ought to call on the Lord when they by themselves yes. and say, Lord, bless my church. <laughs> Lord, Lord, keep my pastor. Lord, keep every leader. 
Lord, keep those who, who are headed in the wrong direction. You ought to be praying for the unsaved that the Lord will touch and the Lord will reveal and the Lord will unction them that they may get to know him. I'm in Philippians chapter one, moving to verse number seven. God says that we need to make sure that we understand that we've heard these things. And, and ever since the day you heard them and knew them, the grace of God in truth, you ought to make sure that you understand that, that God has grace. And this grace is in truth. Grace is joy, liberality, pleasure, favor, gift. Grace of the Lord is his favor. It's his gift. It's his joy, liberality, pleasure, and thankworthiness. It's God's grace. God's grace ought to be distributed to us in truth. This word truth is it's veracity. It means that it's a fact. It means that it's accurate. We ought to thank God for it. The word of truth, the God of truth, and the how he's blessed us through truth. He's blessed us through truth. Verse number seven, as you also learn from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf. It says Epaphras. We, we believe that this, this word Epaphras is short for a, a character that we talked about in Philippians, which is Epaphroditus. You will find Epaphroditus in, in Philemon 23 or Philippians chapter 2, verses verse 25, or Philippians chapter 4, verses 12, 13, and 18, Epaphroditus. When we talked about him in Philippians, we talked about how he was the runner between Paul and the church at Philippi. He was a minister. He was a, a servant, a fellow prisoner for Paul, and we believe that he was converted by Paul, and what he did was he took word from Paul to the church at Philippi. And, and as Paul encouraged that church, Epaphroditus was the one that was taking Paul, the good news in the prison, and taking the message of Paul back to the church at Philippi. Epaphroditus is his name. Short here called Epaphroditus. Paul says that Epaphroditus is a fellow servant. In other words, he's a cold slave. He is a fellow prisoner. Now, this is twofold here. He is a fellow, fellow prisoner in the fact that he is also a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul oftentimes talked about the fact that I'm a prisoner of the Lord Jesus Christ. I have chosen to follow him. He is a co-slave with Paul. A co-slave means that he has, he has decided to follow Paul's leadership and has the decided to follow Jesus Christ. Let me just stop right here. I know you don't like being called a slave. I know that you don't want to be a slave. None of us want to be a slave. But let me just share, you, share with you, if you're not a slave for Jesus Christ, if you're not a slave for God the Father, if you're not a slave for God the Holy Spirit, you are a slave for the devil. Because you're going to be a slave to something or somebody. Some people are slave to their cars. Some people are slave to their houses. Some people are slave to their men, women, boys, and girls. You need to be a slave, a fellow yokeman in the gospel of Jesus Christ, a fellow servant, a co-slave, a co-prisoner with Paul in the gospel ministry. We just say to you, if you're not called to be a preacher, you ought to be one who supports the preacher. Yeah. If you're not called to be an evangelist, you ought to send money to make sure the evangelist gets where he needs to be. If you're not called to be a teacher, you shouldn't give the teacher hell when the teacher is teaching. You ought to support the teacher. Mm -hmm. This is how we support the Lord's ministry. We ought to always give ourselves to the Lord's ministry. Yes. Paul says here about Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, 
who is a faithful minister of Christ on his own behalf, on your behalf. In other words, he's saying to this church, he said that he's a faithful minister to Christ for you on your behalf. Yes. It is believed that Epaphroditus actually, or Epaphroditus, actually planted the church at Colossian and pa at Colossae, and Paul never made a visit there. He was just writing a letter, and he was taking information from Epaphroditus. So Paul is saying, them, saying to them, we heard of your love, we've heard of your hope, we have heard of your faith through Epaphroditus yes. because he brought good news to us. Mm -hmm. Look at what he says in verse number eight, who also declared to us your love in the spirit. Yes. It says it, it, has, he has, it has occurred to us that this faithful man, Epaphroditus, he was faithful, meaning that he was trustworthy and he was believable. In other words, Epaphroditus or Epaphroditus wasn't going to lie on you. And he wasn't going to lie for you. He was going to bring the right word back just as you are. He's faithful. And he declared to Paul the love in the spirit of the church at Colossae. He was faithful. This word declare means that he, he made it plain. It was a signification of them being faithful to the Lord. Mm -hmm. That their love reigned. Says in the love, in the spirit, your love in the spirit, mm -hmm. the Holy Spirit. We ought to have a love fest like this church at, at Colossae. The Colossian church, they had a love fest. They loved on people. Doesn't matter how many tattoos they have. It, it didn't matter how long their earrings were or how short they were. Didn't matter what they had them in their eye, their eyebrows, their nose. They loved on them. Didn't matter if they had gone to prison or not. You see, even Paul probably couldn't preach in Houston. Because people don't like people who've gone to prison. They, they're still afraid. They hadn't gotten over it. Doesn't matter what persuasion they are, mm -hmm. what color they are, what race they are, what gender they are. And it does not matter whether they're confused with their gender. Yes. What matters the most is that this church loved people. Mm -hmm. And our churches ought to love people. Amen. Our churches ought to be called the house of love. He said, he says in this final verse, verse eight, and I'll leave you alone. Uh, Colossians chapter one, verse number eight, who also declared to us your love in the spirit. They walked in the spirit. They lived in the spirit. They had a love fest. They had, they had, they had charity and they did it by way of the Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit is the supernatural breath of God. The Holy Spirit that lives in us, that dwells in us. And if the Holy Spirit lives in you and dwells in you, you ought to have a manifestation of the Holy Spirit. I'm not talking about shouting. I'm not talking about speaking in other tongues. I'm not talking about running the floor. You ought to have the fruit of the Spirit. Yes. As it is found in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25. You ought to do a check on yourself one day. <laughs> you ought to go by Galatians chapter 5, 22 through 25 and see how many of these characteristics do you portray and do you have. All of us can say we have them, but is it manifesting in our mannerism? Is it manifesting in our spirit? Things like love, joy, peace, meekness. Temperance, long suffering. Yeah, yeah. These these things ought to manifest itself in every believer. But you have to grow to that point. You have to learn to love God. And if you're listening to me today and you have not received Jesus as your personal Savior, you need to try Him today. Mm -hmm. The door of the church is open. 
You need to try Jesus. You need to try him in order to really, really have love. You need to try him by the faith that he died for you on a skull hill called Calvary. The Bible says if you believe the story that you can have hope. These three things that Paul points out with this church, you can be a part of this church and you can have the same hope. You have love, you have faith, you can have hope and you can have hope of a home in the sky. Mm -hmm. But you must be born again. You have to be. You must be. You've got to be born again. And the only way to be born again is trust Jesus as your Savior. Yes. Believing that he's the Son of God. And out of obedience unto God, he gave his life as a ransom for you and me. You don't have to run around the room. You don't have to scream to the top of your voice. You don't have to jump and shout. These things you may do. You don't have to speak in tongues. These things you may choose to do, that's left up to you and the Holy Spirit. But what you must do is repentantly believe that Jesus is the Son of God. That he gave his life for you. That he died over 2,000 years ago on a skull hill called Calvary. He did it for you. And he did it for me. And three days later, he rose from the dead. The Bible says, if you believe this story, you can catch that flight out of here that Paul talks about. That one of these days at the trump of God, we're going to leave all this stuff behind. Viruses, no more. Racism, no more. Discrimination, no more. Gossiping, no more. Fake people, no more. But in order to catch that flight out of here, you must be born again. You must believe the story that Jesus died for your sins. He was buried in a borrowed tomb. And early that third day morning, he rose from the dead. If you've never received him, if this is you, you need to receive him. You can do that right now. Just join me in this simple prayer. I'm going to bow my head and I want you to repeat after me. And the only thing I'm going to lead you to saying is, Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Come into my life and make me a new person. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. Would you bow with me today and Invite the Lord Jesus into your life so you can qualify for the, the treasures, the rewards that we have that are laid up for us in heaven because you've received Jesus as your Savior. Join me now. Lord Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you rose from the dead. Now come into my life and make me a new person. Thank you for saving my soul. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen and thank God. We believe if you honestly prayed that prayer, we believe you are now born again. We believe that you should be a part, a part of a good Bible teaching church. And for that church, I recommend New Beginning Church. Where Jesus is the main attraction. Where Jesus is the center of attention. If you receive Jesus tonight, will you inbox me and let me know that you received him as your Savior? And if you want to join the New Beginning Church, inbox me and let me know that you want to be a part of this great family of faith where we're walking with Jesus and trusting Jesus on a daily basis. A church where we have a lively hope that Jesus is coming back to get us one day. Will you join us in serving Jesus Christ on planet Earth so we can really, really have fun on the other side? Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for being a part of our service. It is now offering time. It is offering time. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes offering 
and sacrificial gifts. It is time to give to the Lord through tithes, offerings, and sacrificial gifts. You can give to the New Beginning Church in three forms. First of all, you can give by way of cash out. Our cash tag is NBC Souls. Cash tag NBC Souls. You can give by cash out. Cash tag dollar sign NBC Souls. Or you can give by Zelle. Zelle, you can do so by email. Zelle's is lifting.jesus at yahoo.com. Lifting dot jesus at yahoo.com or you can mail your offering to p.o box 503 missouri city texas 77459 p.o box 503 missouri city texas 77459 and we want to invite you to join us on sunday morning as well as wednesday nights sunday morning for sunday school at 9 a.m every sunday 9 a.m. every Sunday for Sunday school. 10.45 a.m. for morning service every Sunday. And then again on Wednesday night, as you have joined us tonight, at 7.20 p.m. We'll be so glad to have you and so glad that you've come to worship with us. Please feel free to send your offering to one of these three places and continue to join us as we worship the Lord. We enjoyed our time together on prayer line on last night. Our next prayer time will be <clears throat> by way of Zoom. It will be on second Tuesday for the phone call prayer and fourth Tuesday, which is the coming up Tuesday, two weeks from last night, will be our time for our Zoom prayer. Uh, some of you prefer Zoom, come on and be a part of our prayer time. We are talking to the Lord about all our issues and, and what life is taking us through right now. This is a good time to call on the Lord and be prayerful. Again, thank you so much for joining us here at the New Beginning Church from our remote location. Thank you for being a part of our service. Please feel free to come by, send us an inbox, join our church and be a part of this great movement unto the Lord. Thank you, God bless you, and God keep you is our prayer. Let's go to God in prayer. Father God, we thank you now. We bless your name. We thank you for your mercy and your grace. We thank you for another privilege to come before you. Now, Lord, we ask you to bless everyone in our hearing. Bless us, Father God, that we will be reminded to give love to all mankind. That we will be reminded to trust Jesus Christ by our faith that he has given us. And that we will be reminded, Father God, to always maintain a lively hope that on the other side, there's great treasures for what we've done over here. And remind us, Father God, that we will be blessed as we own planet Earth if we totally put our faith and our trust in you. Lord, we trust in you now, Father God, to get rid of COVID-19. We trust in you, Father God, to amaze the doctors. We trust in you, Father God, to do away with all the indications that scientists have come up with. Lord, we know, Father God, that you can do it. Lord, we pray that you do it speedily. We pray that you do it in a hurry. That lives will be saved. That people will be called to faith in Jesus Christ. And that men, women, boys, and girls will get to know you as the only living and true God. We thank you for getting our attention. And we ask you, Father God, to safeguard our health and our strength. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we ask it all. Amen and thank God. Here at the New Beginning Church, we are uniting the church, strengthening families, supporting schools, and empowering neighborhoods to impact the world as we are reaching souls by lifting Jesus. Jesus says, if I, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men unto me. God bless you and God keep you is our prayer.